finally, my first day at school has come. Yay! This special occasion called for my favorite hoodie. Super cool, right? <laughs> but then, out of nowhere, I was blocked by a group of boys and their cheesy pickup lines. No time for monkey business, but they wouldn't let me go. Hey, do you know who I am? I'm... Everything suddenly went blurry. Oh no, my glasses! I stumbled around trying to grab them back, but got shoved to the floor. Everyone scram. Give me that. I looked up and vaguely saw my hero offering me a hand. He gave me my glasses and I profusely thanked him. But he just gave me a cold look and walked off without saying a word. Strange. Oh, by the way, I'm Hazel Palmer, 17 years old. But I'm not here as a student, but a teacher. Yes, you heard it right. Not to brag, but I'm kind of a genius. <laughs> I even got offered a position in my college's research project, which I have rejected to pursue my dream of becoming a high school teacher. So here I am on my very first day of fulfilling it. First, I was introduced to the other teachers, but unlike what I had in mind, they just threw me judgy looks. Luckily, after the meeting, a young teacher named Rebecca kindly welcomed me and even tipped me off about some of the rebels at school. Now time to meet my students. As soon as I finished my introduction, the whole class immediately turned into a beehive. Miss, how about we continue this lesson at the movies tonight? Mullet, Paris Nose, this guy must be the notorious Lucas that Rebecca warned me about. Please, as if you'd date someone who would wear such a goofy hoodie. Yeah, who let a weeaboo teach here? Jeez, I didn't expect this reaction. I tried to restore the silence, but to no avail. Ugh, I'm out of patience. Quiet, or else you'll all get Fs. Thank God it worked. Whew, that'll show them who's in charge. But here comes another problem. No way! There's gotta be someone who's really here to study, right? Okay, who is our class's top student? Ethan! Ethan. Ah, didn't he help me in the hallway? But it looked like he didn't recognize me. Okay, let's see. Ethan, right? Could you solve this equation? A equation? N no, equation. I suppose spelling is a bit hard for a numbers person like you. And the whole class burst into laughter. Jeez, this guy was unbelievable. Hmm, how about the second best student? Cassie Santago? That name sounded just like my old classmates. I turned to the corner where an arm reluctantly raised. Oh my, it's her! So good to see a familiar face here. But why is she avoiding me? That afternoon, while walking to my car, I saw Cassie and her friends picking on a girl. Upon seeing me, they immediately ran away, but I managed to catch Cassie. Cassie, since when did you become a mean girl? None of your business. Report me to the principal if you like. Then she strutted away, leaving me standing there confused. Since when had the sweet Cassie ended up on the dark side? Turned out, not long ago, Cassie's father passed away in an accident, leaving her to live with her stepmother. This must left her in so much grief that she put up this cold, reckless facade as a defense mechanism. That's so sad. So, to make Cassie feel included, and also to improve this whole class's performance, I came up with a master plan. More homework. Not finished? Minus points. And every lesson will come with a gift. A test during recess, and I asked Cassie and Ethan to help the other students. But when I called Cassie to the board, strangely, she couldn't do a simple equation. At first, I thought that it was just her being rebellious, but during the test that day, I noticed her copying Ethan's answers. Does that mean all her A's were from cheating? Not only that, the even shocker thing I found out was that Ethan was her stepbrother. After class, I came to talk to her, but she didn't pay me any attention. Cassie, I know the secret behind your A's. High scores mean nothing when they're not from your own hard work. But out of my business. <laughs> You're as much my friend as you are a proper teacher. I'd be pleased to tutor you. How about today? See you in the library after school. As if I care. Her words did hurt, but I guess she was just trying to keep her cold image. So I still waited for her, but she never showed up. No matter how much I tried, Cassie ignored me and kept cheating. During the midterm test, she even blatantly snatched Ethan's paper. It's true she's my friend, but I couldn't let it slide any longer, so I dismissed her test. That had to be done. <sighs> On the same day, while I was in the library searching for materials, I heard familiar voices talking. Ms. Palmer is way too much. She even dismissed Cassie's test today. Can you believe this? Why can't she be understanding like you? Cut her some slack, Sadie. She's just doing what she thinks is best. So that's what my students really thought of me? After everything I did to try and help them, 
Yet all I got back was bad-mouthing? And Rebecca was so nice to defend me like that. No wonder they liked her. <sighs> a few days later, the unexpected happened. Cassie, Lucas, and a few others came and asked for extra lessons. Finally, they started to have another eye on studying. But little did I know that it's just a ruse for my dear students to turn the following days into a nightmare. And the instigator was Lucas, I supposed. One day, I almost fainted upon finding a huge ant nest inside my bag. The other day, my pants were stuck to the chair with some gum. <sighs> Fortunately, Ethan always showed up in time to help me. He's such a riddle. Unlike before, not only did he try to defend me in class, but he also helped me carry my textbooks. But I didn't expect him to care that much. One time, I saw him at the car wash where I worked part-time. I quickly hid behind a car, but Ethan just kept walking towards my wash box. I'm here to see you, so no need to hide. Let me give you a hand. After my shift, Ethan took me home. We talked a lot, and I felt comfortable enough to tell him about my mom's health condition and how I took this part-time job to cover her hospital fee. This side of him was far different from the normal, and it was heartwarming. Suddenly, we noticed an elderly lady who seemed lost, so we offered to take her home. And guess what? She's the grandma of the notorious Lucas. I was truly surprised by how much of a rebel like Lucas cared for his nana. I could tell he really loved her a lot. Poor boy. She's the only family he got now. Lucas, I know studying is not your thing, but have you thought about how happy your grandma would be if you at least tried? Since then, Lucas stopped causing me any mischief, and so did the other students. Now they could even do simple math themselves. Baby steps. <laughs> Seeing my effort finally bore fruit, I set up a parent meeting to report students' progress. Halfway through my presentation, a photo of me cosplaying as Sailor Moon popped up on the screen. Oh my god, why is it here? How dare you let this childish thing teach my kids? Then she stormed off, followed by everyone else. I thought I finally had my students on my side. Turns out I never did. Then came the last straw, my mom's medical test results. I couldn't help but cry, letting all my bottled up emotions out. Then, suddenly, a hand laid on my shoulder. What's wrong? My mom's health turned worse, and she needs an urgent operation. I'm sorry to hear that. It's all gonna be okay. Be strong, Miss Palmer. I appreciated him comforting me, and when I felt a bit better, we decided to leave. But the door was locked from the outside. It must have been a prank from my students. Again! We tried banging the door and screaming for help but eventually gave up and waited for someone to come. This quiet atmosphere sure does have a way of making people open up, and I got to know about Ethan. Seemed like both of us have problems with our beloved family. What's yours? I... I have a sister. You know who. That I really adore. But no matter how hard I try, she always builds a wall between us. Oh, wasn't this the first time Ethan talked about his personal life? He always put on a cold and distant mask but I knew deep down he had his struggles too. I was so absorbed in his story that I forgot about being locked up and gradually fell asleep until a buzzing sound startled me and countless phone cameras were pointing at us. Guys, check your phones. Look what Miss Palmer and Ethan have been doing this whole time. Oh my, a bunch of photos of me and Ethan have been uploaded on the school website and from some angles, it looked like we were kissing. Oh no. I tried to explain, but they just threw me a disgusted look. And why was Ethan just standing here saying nothing? This soon reached the principal. He told me there would be a case hearing for inappropriate relationship with a student. How was this even possible? As I dragged my feet to the principal's office, suddenly I heard familiar voices shouting. Why did you do that? I told you to find her weakness, and look what you got. Nothing. I've done everything I could. What else do you want? Everything? Then why is she still here? As long as she's around, she messes up our cheating stuff. And mom will get my head chewed off for being useless at school. Or is that what you want, brother? What? So Cassie had been pulling the strings this entire time? And Ethan was her puppet, befriending me just to please his sister. I knew she hated me, but did Ethan have to be so heartless too? Cassie then caught my eye, so I ran away. I was still trying to process this when I walked in to see the school council glaring at me. You're an insult to the teaching profession which leaves us no choice. I was ready for the worst, when Ethan rushed in. Stop! It was me who deliberately jammed the classroom's lock to get back at her for being too strict, but I accidentally got stuck too. There's nothing going on between us. And so, I was cleared of all charges, and Ethan ended up in a week-long suspension. 
Why did he do that after all? After such a long trial, I drove around town to blow off some steam, then saw Cassie fighting with a security guard. I found out that Cassie stole a bracelet and was refusing to call her parents. The guard said he'd have to call the cops, so I came forward as her teacher to bail her out. Cassie asked me why I helped her, but I didn't bother explaining myself and just left. Since that day, Cassie didn't attend the extra classes. After his suspension, Ethan returned with his offhand attitude. <sighs> no time to worry about those two. My mission now was to prepare my students for the upcoming finals and regain my prestige. Luckily, they started to take studying seriously and invested a lot in these tests. One day, when I walked into class, some students even asked me to help solve advanced exercises. Two weeks later, when the results came, my excited students all rushed over to me. Miss Palmer, thanks to you, the questions were the same as the ones you showed us the other day, so it only took us a blink to finish. What are they talking about? Before I could understand, the principal summoned me to his office. As I entered, he angrily showed me the math sheet that I was allegedly teaching in the extra class. What kind of work ethic allows leaking exam questions, Miss Palmer? Leak the test? Me? No! Please! No more excuses. You're fired. No, no! They can't punish me for something I didn't do. Someone must have framed me. I asked my students where they got that piece of paper, and they said it was already on the table when they came to class. So Cassie and Ethan must have been behind this. Good job, Ethan, for putting up their remorse act just to set up a bigger plan to humiliate me. Okay, then. They won. Unemployed and desperate, with hospital bills to cover, I had to work full-time at the car wash, as well as taking night shifts at 7-Eleven. But besides the measly wages was a bonus of rotten eggs and tomatoes, scornful looks and snarky comments saying I didn't deserve the teacher title. <sighs> the scandal truly turned my life upside down. Then, when I was at the hospital with my mom, suddenly Ethan rushed in and said he would clear my name. Clear my name? Wasn't he the one who put dirt on me? What was he playing this time? With nothing to lose, I reluctantly went with him. He led me to the school's control room. The principal was also there. Then I saw Sadie standing on stage. Ethan said it was her who discreetly put the math sheet on the table. What? But Rebecca? I distributed the test like you said, but I'm scared. What if someone finds out? Don't worry, now that Miss Palmer's fired, who else can dig this up? I'm only taking back my position as the beloved teacher who can take cover for y'all. No, I have to tell the principal everything. Who would believe you? I would. Furious, I rushed over to the stage and confronted her. Rebecca, I thought you were my friend. How could you? Don't ask me. Ask your phony self. Weren't you just trying to get the students to like you? What nonsense was she saying? I'm just doing my part of being a good teacher. How could she be so selfish and cruel? Out of jealousy? Miss Palmer earned her students' respect with her pure heart. Look at you. The so-called love you have comes from buttering them up with all your lies. That's why they turn stubborn and make light of studying. I never knew you were that kind of person. How could you call yourself a teacher? The principal couldn't hide his rage, fired Rebecca, then apologized to me and offered me my job back. But after all these troubles, this school had completely drained me. I couldn't take it anymore, so I refused. As I was wiping away my tears, Ethan came to my side. Miss Palmer... I'm sorry for everything I did. I just tried to please Cassie, but now I know I was only hurting you. I've already known about that. I was about to leave when a group of students led by Cassie approached us. Then Ethan told me it was Cassie who helped him with the plan to bait Rebecca into admitting her actions. Sorry for all the horrible things I did to you. Please stay. We've learned a lot since you moved here. Please don't leave us. Such a crazy term. I ended up staying. I mean, this is my dream job after all, and I'm not one to give up that easily. I also talked to Cassie's stepmom about her studying. Turns out she didn't realize her strict approach was causing a rift between them all. Cassie, Ethan, and their mom had to talk, and now they seem to understand each other better. I was so happy for them, and we became friends after that. Time flies, and now my students, or my friends, to be correct, graduated, and would soon fly off to pursue their own dreams. Suddenly... Ethan dragged me to a corner. So from now on, we're no longer teacher and student, right? I guess, but so... But could you still teach me? Teach me how to love you. Hi, 
it's me again, Diane. In part two of my story, I started to work in my parents' company, but I didn't have the courage to tell them the truth that I was their long-lost daughter. Fortunately, one day, I found out that Brett, my boyfriend, wasn't my half-brother, and that his mom, Ashley, had been lying this whole time. But I didn't want to unveil the truth because I didn't want Brett to get hurt. That was until the day I bumped into Ashley. In the store, I watched as she looked at the photo of me and my mom and aunt from when I was just a baby, and the look of recognition on her face as she realized my aunt was the kidnapper she hired nearly 20 years ago. She looked at me terrified. Are, are, are you that baby? Are, are you also the one I saw in the company earlier this afternoon? What are you doing with Brett and his dad there? Did you... Did you know everything? She shot questions at me and didn't even wait for my response. Instead, she just started yelling at me, claiming that I was plotting to get revenge on her for stealing my life away from me. I knew it was pointless trying to explain to her, so I said nothing and watched as she ran out of the store without buying anything. The next day when I got to the company, I found out that Brett had suddenly disappeared. He hadn't come to work and no one could get in touch with him. My dad told me that he'd gone to see his mom the night before, and after that, he hadn't come home. Oh my god. His mom. After he'd bumped into me, had she done something bad to him? I couldn't bear it. My aunt had given me Ashley's address, so I went there to find out what was going on. As soon as she opened the door, I asked her where Brett was, and she just smirked at me and said she told him I was his half-sister and that I was preparing to kick him out of my dad's family. So, she said he must have run away because he was so disgusted by me. I felt so angry I wanted to scream. Ashley was ruining everything. She even said to me, You can't fool me. It's no coincidence that you're working in your dad's company and that you've seduced Brett. You're doing all of this on purpose. Well, that just made me even angrier. I said to her, I know Brett isn't my dad's son. I did a DNA test, and you're lucky I haven't said anything to either of them. But I will now. You better prepare yourself for the consequences. Then I left, leaving her standing there looking angry. I went straight to my parents' house to tell them before Ashley could beat me there to tell them lies. They let me in straight away and asked me what was going on and if it was about Brett. I nodded and took out all the evidence I'd prepared. This was the moment of truth. I was so nervous. I gave them the DNA results of Brett and my dad, then the baby photo of me, and then a letter my aunt had written confessing about how Ashley had hired her to kidnap me. My parents were shocked, of course, and had a lot of questions, but soon it all became clear and we all started crying. It was just so overwhelming. I even told them about what Ashley had told Brett the night before and begged them to believe me that I didn't do it all on purpose. Of course they said they believed me, and I was relieved. But the very next day, you won't believe what Ashley told them. My parents went straight to Ashley's the next day to confront her, and she couldn't deny it because there was so much evidence. But then she told my parents that she had been feeling so guilty, so she was the one who'd gotten in touch with my aunt and encouraged her to tell me the truth and then help me find my parents. After my parents told me this, I told them Ashley was lying. She was trying to make herself look like an angel when she was none other than the devil. I suggested to my parents we sue her or something, and then a few days later, Ashley got in touch with me. She'd found out where I lived, and as soon as I let her in, she begged me not to sue her. She'd obviously already received a warning letter from my parents' lawyer. She said she had a family to care for and didn't want them to know about her past. Then she promised me she'd never come near me or my family again. I was sick of her now and asked her to leave. But then she apologized again and she really regretted everything she told Brett and that she'd gone to see him. What? Where did you find him? I asked. And she told me that she found him at her parents' house, where she and Brett had lived when he was little before she'd gotten married. Oh, that's right. I knew Brett loved his grandparents so much and often visited them. I hadn't even thought that that was where he could be. Then she told me that Brett hadn't disappeared because he was disgusted by me. It was because he felt so guilty about everything that had happened. She told me she'd already gone to see him and confessed because she wanted to at least be seen as an honest mother in her son's eyes. 
After I told Brett that he isn't your dad's son, he got so angry and shouted at me that he hated me and never wanted to see me again. It crushed me. Ashley told me and started to cry. Please forgive me, Diane, she continued. I've lost Brett. Surely that's punishment enough for everything I've done? I thought that what I did would help Brett so he could grow up in a wealthy family. But turns out all I did was hurt the people around me, especially Brett. Can you guess what I did next? I went to meet my parents and asked them to remove all accusations against Ashley. You're probably wondering why I changed my tune so quickly. Well, I felt like enough revenge had already happened, and I couldn't bear anyone suffering anymore. All I'd ever wanted was to have a peaceful life, and revenge only satisfies us for a second. It doesn't make us happy in the long term. After that, Ashley came to apologize to my parents, and swore she'd completely disappear from our life after that. Then she gave us Brett's grandparents' address, and asked us not to put any blame on Brett. Then she left. Poor Brett. When I went to meet him, it was clear he was the one who'd been hurt most by all of this. His grandparents told me that after Ashley had revealed the truth to him, he'd lock himself up in his room and hadn't come out. I knocked on his door and begged him to let me in. After a while, he opened the door, and I couldn't believe how he looked. He'd become so skinny, and his eyes were so sad. It made me so upset to see him like this. He said to me that he blamed himself for everything. For the big lie my life had been, for my parents' loss of their only child, and for the way we'd broken up. He truly believed all of this was because of him and his mom. I hugged him and told him none of this was his fault, and I asked him to come back to my parents' house because we all missed him so much. He eventually agreed, but I could see he was nervous, especially when both my parents knew that Brett wasn't related to them by blood. But my parents welcomed him back into the house. However, I could see they were feeling a bit awkward about what to say. So I stood up and said to them, Even though you guys aren't actually related, you've still been so happy together. Just like my adoptive mom, she ended up getting a daughter she might never have had. And you got a son that brought you so much joy. Sure, there were lots of lies, but we were still happy, right? Believe it or not, everything worked out after that. Brett and I went back to school, and we've both decided to go work at my parents' company after graduation. I have chosen to move in with my parents, but of course, I still visit my adoptive mom and aunt all the time. My adoptive mom understands that this is important for me, so that I can get to know my parents properly and catch up on lost time. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. I asked my parents to forgive my adoptive mom and aunt, because even though they acted wrongly in the past, they still raised me and did such an amazing job. As for Brett, he moved out into his own place, but still visits my parents all the time. However, Brett and I are no longer dating. It wasn't because of my parents, though. Let's be honest, it would just be too weird if we kept dating after everything we'd been through. It was a hard decision for us both, but it's for the best. We both need to move on so that we can have a better future. And hey, at least we can still be friends, and soon, colleagues too. Hey guys, Stephanie here. I have a question for you. Promise to be honest, okay? Have you ever had a crush on one of your teachers? If yes, I guess you could somehow relate to my story. I'm going to tell you all about my super fine boyfriend, Joseph. I put so much effort into winning him over, but trust me, he was worth every second. So this all began last year when I was a sophomore at college, majoring in performing arts. When it came to boys my own age, blech, talk about boring. I didn't pay much attention to them, as they were so childish, and honestly, they just annoyed me. If I had to choose between dating some immature jerk or staying single forever, there was no contest. One day, I was over at my bestie Susie's place. We've been friends since forever, and even though we now went to different colleges, we still met up loads. As we were eating Susie's delicious homemade burgers, we talked about college, outfits, boys, you know, that kind of thing. That's when Susie told me all about the new professor at her college called Joseph. She described him as extremely handsome, tall, intelligent, sporty, and he owned a motorcycle. He sounded far too good to be true, so I convinced myself there must be a catch. Perhaps he had bad acne, or maybe he had a wife and three kids or something. He doesn't have acne, he's not married, and he looks like this. She held up her phone. 
On it was the image of a seriously hot guy. I grabbed the phone off her and scrolled through his social media pictures. Jeez, this guy was so fine. So what if I'd never met him? I knew I needed to make him mine. I needed a plan, so I begged Susie to help me out. She thought I was crazy, but hey, she'd been besties with me forever, so she knew I liked to go all out on things. She snuck me into class with her. It was economics. Boring! But staring at Joseph was worth it, and his voice was so dreamy. I knew I couldn't just sit there. I needed to make Joseph notice me. After class, I walked over to him, swished back my hair, and in my cutest voice said, Hey, great class, but there are a few points I'm struggling to understand. Perhaps you could help me out? He looked a bit awkward, but he agreed. I blabbed out a few questions about the class, and he waffled out some answers which I didn't understand. I knew I'd have to do better than this to keep his attention, so I continued to sneak into the class. One time, I pretended to fall out of my chair and feigned blacking out. I even dabbed white powder under my eyes before class so I looked extra weary. My hope was that he'd rush over to me and carry me to the infirmary. But no, some stupid other guy had taken that chance from him. Worse still, this doofus was so clumsy that as he was carrying me through the doorway, he knocked my arm against the door frame. Ouch! I bit down on my lip and kept my eyes closed. Jeez. Why had my amazing plan turned into a disaster? Ugh. I opened my eyes just in time to witness the nurse coming at me with a huge needle. I screamed out, jumped off the bed, and told her I was feeling much better now. Despite my failed plan in pretending to be sick, I immediately came up with another one. One day, I punctured my own bike tire, then pretended to sadly walk my bike to the parking lot and asked Joseph to give me a lift. He shook his head, said he was too busy, then whizzed off on his motorcycle. I stood there speechless. Worse still, I had to walk my bike all the way home. Another time, I waited until it was just him and me left in class. Then, on my way past him, I dropped my books. Then I said, oh no, how clumsy of me, as I bent down to pick them up. Oh yeah, I was also wearing my tightest pair of jeans. I didn't think that there's any way he could resist me in those but he didn't even help me pick my books up. Instead, he coughed to clear his voice, then said, Can you hurry up, please? It's my lunch break, and I haven't eaten since breakfast. Typical. I was there looking sexy, and all he could think about was his stomach. I wasn't going to give up now. I hadn't attended a bunch of yawn-inducing economics lectures for nothing. So, thanks to my social media snooping, I knew Joseph's birthday was coming up. On his actual birthday, I had a class with him. Talk about fate! So I brought him a cake and made the entire class sing happy birthday to him. Then I announced I had a special birthday surprise for him, and I sang out Louis Capaldi's Someone You Loved. The rest of the class whooped and cheered, but he just looked down at his desk. Okay, so this was getting frustrating. What did I need to do to get this guy's attention? Jeez, I tried everything already. That Friday, one of Susie's college friends was having a party, so I tagged along. I sat in the corner and moaned out to Susie how I felt like I was getting nowhere with Joseph. I just didn't get it. Whatever I did, he just didn't seem bothered. I moaned out, Susie, should I keep flirting with him? He didn't even lay an eye on me. He was such a tough guy, you know? Like an old boot. In fact, a rock had more personality than he did. Then Susie gave me a sign, but I kept saying, and maybe he was gay or something? Like, you see, he showed no interest in girls. That's when Susie hit my arm, and when I looked up, I was completely shocked. Joseph was right there, looking at me. While I froze in shock, he shook his head, then stormed off. Without even thinking, I immediately stood up, rushed after him, and apologized. He ignored me and hopped onto his motorcycle, so I jumped onto the back of it and refused to move. Please, I didn't mean what I said. Please, just listen to me. I begged. In the end, he passed me a helmet and told me to put it on. I couldn't help but feel excited. I'd wanted to ride on the back of his motorcycle ever since I'd first seen a picture of him on it. O-M-G. Now it was actually happening! Okay, so this wasn't how I envisioned it, but still, this was amazing. And I made sure to hug my arms tightly around his waist. Purely for safety purposes, of course. After about ten minutes, he stopped at a deserted road. I thought he was going to shout at me, but instead, he turned around and smiled at me. 
Wow, without the frown on his face, he looked even hotter. So, what were you saying about me earlier? He asked. Um, nothing. It was just a misunderstanding. That's funny, because it sounded like you thought I had no personality, and, um, what was it? Oh, yes, you think I'm gay. I, um, I'm sorry. You might be gay. Um, it doesn't matter if you are. Um, and, um, you have a great personality. Suddenly, he leaned forward and kissed me. OMG, talk about amazing! I was shocked, but so happy, even though I didn't know what was going on. As soon as he pulled away, I pulled him back so we could continue kissing. Then he said, I'm not gay, and I like to think I have a dazzling personality. I just like playing with you, but it seems like there must be a long time for you to be more mature. But it's okay. I'd train you then. Be my girlfriend. Turns out, he'd noticed me too but he wanted to see what happened first. Also, he thought I needed to grow up a bit, as my stunts, although amusing, were a bit on the childish side. But he also found the amount of effort I went to to get his attention flattering. He told me how he'd only shown up at that party as he'd overheard me talking about it at college, and he wanted to come just because of me. I don't go to his classes anymore, which gives me far more time to concentrate on my actual classes. But we are now an official couple, and I couldn't be happier. So this is the story of how I ended up with the hottest boyfriend known to mankind. My advice to you is to be bold in the pursuit of love. As if you just sit around waiting for it to drop on your doorstep, well, you'll be waiting forever. Go get him, tiger. That's what I did, and it totally worked for me. So there's no reason why it can't work for you, too. Perfect when suddenly... I saw a flurry of red storming toward me, and then the next thing I knew, I was being slapped across the face. Ugh, it was my ex, Rosie. She was looking at me as if she wanted to snap me in half. Okay, so Rosie and me had only broken up yesterday. But that didn't mean she had the right to go full psycho on me. Hey, so I'm Andrew, and I like to think I'm a pretty smart guy. The problem is, I'm a sucker for hot girls. I tend to be blinded by their beauty. The result being, I don't always make the best decisions around them. But I had no idea what drama my weakness for a pretty girl was about to get me into. So it all began with the end-of-term college party. Me and my friends went heavy on the drinks. So when my friend Brad bet me a burger that I wouldn't go and ask Lisa to dance, well, I didn't hesitate in approaching her. Jeez, she's so hot and way out of my league. So I was expecting her to tell me to go away. But instead, she smiled and let me lead her over to the dance floor. While we were dancing, she whispered in my ear that she'd always like me. Then, yep, you guessed it, Rosie, my crazy ex, stormed over and slapped me. I woke up the next morning with a pounding headache. Ugh, what was all that shouting coming from outside my open window? I wrapped my bed cover around me and shuffled my way over there to take a look. Huh, Lisa and Rosie were yelling at each other. He's mine, not yours. Stay away. He wants me, not you. Deal with it. Oh yeah? Well, maybe we should ask Andrew who he prefers. What's the point? As we both know, he'll pick me. I was far too hungover for this, so I closed the window and went back to bed. These girls, they wouldn't stop. For the next few days, they bombarded me with messages and waited for me outside my house. Okay, so most guys dream of two hot girls fighting over them, but trust me, watching them pull each other's hair extensions out isn't as glamorous as it sounds. Thankfully, my prayers were answered by none other than Richie, my awesome brother. He showed up with a ticket for a luxury two-week cruise trip. He'd booked it ages ago, but then a work thing came up, so the ticket was all mine. Hell yeah! I hugged my brother, grabbed the ticket out of his hand, and started packing. The tricky part was sneaking past Rosie and Lisa, who were still lingering about outside. So I borrowed my housemate's hoodie and baseball cap and pretended to be him to get past them. Result? They didn't even double look at me. Goodbye to my Lisa and Rosie nightmare, and hello to the vacation of my dreams. Ah, this is the life. Trust my brother to book such a lavish place. My room was huge, and it had my very own balcony. There was so much to do here, from the outdoor bar, dozens of restaurants, swimming pool, cinema. I was on my own floating complex. Heaven! The next morning when I woke up in my king-size bed, I took in the sounds of silence. Yep, oh sweet silence, how I've missed you. This was a no-girl arguing zone. <laughs> I got changed and walked over to the outdoor bar. 
It definitely wasn't too early for a cocktail. I had a pair of shades on, and that's when I spotted her. Whoa, she was beautiful. I quickly ordered two cocktails and began walking toward her. I was about to hand her the drink when I tripped over a sun lounger, and in slow motion I watched the cup fall. I desperately tried to grab it, but nope. Instead, I managed to knock into her back. She let out a yelp and then yelled out, You pervert, what do you think you're playing at? I stood there open-mouthed, contemplating if I should dive into the pool to escape this drama or not. Then I looked down at my sunglasses, which in all the action had fallen off. Suddenly, an idea came to me. So I bent down, stretched out my arms, and pretended to fumble around for them. She looked at me for a while, then picked my sunglasses up, placed them in my hand, then said, Oh, I'm sorry, I I didn't realize. Here, let me help you. Then she took my arm and guided me across the pool area. I thanked her. And then, with my trusty shades on, I watched her walk away. So she thought I was blind. Yep, this wasn't my greatest idea, but it got me out of a sticky situation with a hot girl, at least. Later that night, I went to the buffet restaurant for dinner. I was stacking my plate when I bumped straight into someone and almost dropped my plate. Ugh, it was that odd girl again. I quickly put my shades on, then deliberately turned the wrong way and loudly said, Oh, I'm sorry. She put her hand on my shoulder and guided me so I was facing her, then said, Yeah, it's me, the girl from the pool. And it's okay, I should have been looking where I was going. Um, do you need any help? I quickly cut her off. No thanks, it's okay. Then I lifted my plate up to my nose and sniffed it. Mmm, these prawns sure smell good. She raised an eyebrow at my food-smelling talent, so I carried on pretending to sniff the food as I put it on my plate. And you know what? She wouldn't quit staring at me. Eventually, she walked off. Phew, what a narrow escape. Afterward, I went to the top deck bar to chill out. With yet another cocktail, then who should walk over but yup, you guessed it, the hot girl. I immediately looked away from her, but what's this? She walked over to me and sat down opposite me. Hey, do you remember me? She asked. Seeing my chance to flirt with her, I replied. Oh yes, how could I forget someone as beautiful as you are? Huh? How do you know that I'm beautiful? Damn it, I needed to think before I spoke. Ah, well, it's your voice. A sweet voice like yours can only belong to a beautiful girl. Crisis averted. As after that, we started chatting, and oh boy, oh boy, she's a sweetheart. Do you know that she's an activist for an organization that works hard to guarantee the rights of baby girls born in Africa? I know, amazing. The evening came to an end, and she said, Oh, my name's Bella, by the way. I replied, Bella, a name as beautiful as your soul. Mine's Andrew. She gave me a nervous giggle. Well, Andrew, (laughs) it's getting late, so I suppose I better get back to my cabin. I didn't want the night to ever end, so I blurted out, Whoa, Bella, look at the sky. Isn't it so stunning? She glared at me and then replied, How would you know that? Oops. Of course, I was meant to be blind. Um, uh, I can feel it from the breeze. She gave me a quizzing look, then said, Right. Well, good night. How about we meet at the arcade tomorrow, let's say 10 a.m.? I excitedly agreed, then she left. Another close escape. I really needed to be more careful. Bella, Bella, Bella. I couldn't stop thinking of her. The next day, I'm such a kid when it comes to arcades, I can't help it. My inner child comes out and, ooh, a car racing game. Nope, I was pretending to be blind. So I awkwardly lingered in the foyer and waited for Bella to show up. When she did, she took my arm and guided me through the arcade. She described all the different games machines to me, which I thought was really sweet. Then she led me over to the plushy grabber machine and squealed excitedly. Hoo-hoo, I loved these as a kid. Soon, I was fumbling about to slot my money in, adamant I was going to win her a plushie. But wait, uh, I was meant to be blind. So I touched the controls, then closed my eyes. Her laughter said it all. Massive fail. It was all going to be okay, until Bella had to use the restroom, and instructed me to stay put and wait for her by a shooting game machine. Which so happened to be my all-time favorite arcade game. I rushed over to it as soon as she was out of sight, grabbed a gun, and shot five cans in a row. Then I jumped up and down and whooped in the air. I turned around and saw Bella frowning at me. Oh boy, busted. I tried to explain, but she just shook her head and said, How could you? You're a coward, a pervert, and a liar. Then she ran off. I felt terrible. I tried searching the ship for her, but I couldn't find her anywhere. Feeling bummed out, I ordered a cocktail, then went for a walk across the deck. Suddenly, I heard shouting coming from below me. Huh? What was that? I peered down and saw a man and a woman trying to drag a little girl into one of the safety rafts. Hang on, they weren't alone. Bella was there, too. She was trying to pull the little girl away from them. Without even thinking, I dropped my drink and ran over to them. 
I charged towards the woman and knocked her so hard she almost fell into the sea. The man reached out to steady her, which gave Bella a chance to pick up the kid. Then she grabbed my arm and pulled me away. After that, the bad guys jumped into the raft and sailed away. We returned the girl to her parents. It turns out Bella was on her way to her cabin when she saw a couple in tears as they couldn't find their daughter. So she went looking for her and walked in on the kidnapping. After that, Bella forgave me. Well, I did save the day and all. And we spent the rest of the trip together. Then on our last day, I got down on one knee and asked her to be my girlfriend. And she said yes. I took her back home with me. And as we walked over to my house, Lisa and Rosie ran towards me and started arguing with each other about who I liked more. Oh shoot, I'd forgotten about them. Reading the situation, Bella approached them. Thank God you're here. I assume one of you is his girlfriend, right? It was an accident, and Andrew's blind now, and he really needs someone by his side 24-7. Hearing that, I quickly coordinated with her by waving my arms wildly about. So, which one is your girlfriend, Andy? Uh, it's Lisa. Rosie quickly chimed in. No, uh, he's all yours. We only hung out once. Ha, <laughs> what suckers. I watched them run away. Then Bella and I burst out laughing. After that, I held my arm out to her and let her guide me home, you know, for old time's sake. Lying to her about being blind was a jerky thing to do, but I only did it in the first place because being around beautiful girls makes me so nervous I do dumb stuff. It's just lucky that Bella forgave me, because I think this dumbass may have found his dream girl. Hi, my name's Kat, which is short for Catherine, but only my mom calls me that. My dad's Indian, and my mom's American. They met back when he was working over here. Then they fell in love, got married, and had me. Unfortunately, it didn't work out, and they split up before I was born. In India, when you marry, it's meant to be for life. But still, my parents got divorced, so the reason for that must have been really serious. So serious that till this day, I still don't know. Every time I asked about it, my parents would just ignore me and change the subject. Anyway, I've always lived with my mom, but my dad lives close by. Most kids from broken homes hate not having both parents around all the time, but this never bothered me. Don't get me wrong, I love my dad and all, but I guess I couldn't miss what I didn't know. Besides, I had far bigger problems to deal with. Okay. So, don't laugh, hear me out. I'm a tomboy, a fact which my mom hates. Yep, I detest wearing skirts and dresses, or anything girly and sparkly. Yuck, give me basketball shorts and a baggy t-shirt any day. Also, I don't understand why some girls spend ages doing their makeup. Why would I want to make myself look like some living doll just to impress people? Please. I didn't get on that well with other girls. I guess I just had nothing in common with them. I didn't care about shopping and watching rom-coms. Nope. I'd much rather be kicking a ball around or playing video games. My best friend's a boy called Harry, and I've known him for, like, forever. He's the one who taught me how to ride a skateboard. Talk about an adrenaline buzz. Now I pretty much go everywhere on one. I'm like a real-life Bart Simpson. For my whole life, my mom's given me disapproving looks. From the time when I only invited boys to my sixth birthday party, tore the arms off the dolls she gave me, and point blank refused to move when she booked me in for ballet classes. I just wasn't a tea time with dolls and teddy bears kind of girl, and I didn't understand why she couldn't just buy me trucks and action figures instead. Then on top of that, mom only dressed me up in skirts and dresses. I had no option but to wear them and endure school feeling so uncomfortable. I mean, have you tried playing soccer in a frilly dress? Talk about ridiculous. The other boys always had to wait for me to straighten out my skirt or try and find the hairpins that kept tumbling out of my hair. I mean, seriously, those things were so lame. By the time I reached 12, I was done wearing girly clothes just to please my mom so I wore comfy, passed-down clothes that I got from my cousins beneath the hideous dresses and took them off en route to school. I was also so sick of my long, boring hair, so one day, I snuck into the barbers after school and got an undercut. Then one evening, I was chilling on the couch when Mom pointed at my hair and in a horrified voice said, Catherine, 
What have you done to yourself? I hadn't realized the way I was lying meant some of my undercut was on show. I just shrugged and replied, It's my hair, so I can do what I want with it. Why would you want to make yourself look ugly? She shouted. It's not ugly. It's cool. My mom looked so shocked. She grounded me for a month, and during that time, she barely spoke to me. The quarreling didn't end there. Over the next few years, it seemed like every little thing I did annoyed her. From chewing on gum to refusing to wear a dress to my cousin's wedding, you name it, it made her mad. On loads of occasions, she shouted at me that she wished I was normal. I didn't get it. My friends and teachers didn't treat me like I was an alien. So why did my mom? One time, when I was about to leave and go and skateboard with Harry, she actually accused me of being a lesbian. I just rolled my eyes at this. For the record, I'm not. I've had crushes on boys before. Anyway, my dad was a lot more chilled than mom. He's totally okay with me being a tomboy. One time, he even sent me a gift box with this really cool sports jersey and shorts in it. I stuck it in my wardrobe to hide it from mom, but she still managed to find it and threw it all in the trash. As I questioned her why she did that, she replied, If you want to live like a boy that much, you should move in with your dad. This made me so mad, so I packed a bag and went to dad's place. He was bugged out by what my mom had done, but still, he told me I should forgive her and that I couldn't live here for good with him as he couldn't be home all the time and take care of me like mom did. Yeah, right. More like he knew mom would never let this happen. It's like she hated me, but she still wanted me around so she had someone to moan at. I stayed with dad for a few days until he had to go on a business trip. Then I had to reluctantly go home, though I was still kind of sulky at my mom. Then came the bombshell as I just arrived home. Mom sat me down and told me that she was dating some new guy called Max. Wow. I knew mom and I weren't close but I had no idea she'd been dating some new dude. We're planning the wedding, and of course I want you to be my bridesmaid, but you'll have to wear a dress. What? She'd known the guy for five minutes, and now she was marrying him? Yeah, whatever, I replied. My mom looked surprised. That's all? You seriously have no problem with this? I got up and walked upstairs to my room while saying, Yeah, mom, I'm okay with it. I support you doing what you like, not like you who always scolds me for my preferences. I could sense my mom being flustered without looking back. Ha! I'd won this round. So, Max moved in with his teenage daughter, Taylor, who's a year younger than me and goes to the same school. Talk about a Barbie. All she seems to be is a mass of shiny blonde hair and pink everything. Seriously, her rucksack, bed covers, curtains, even her phone's pink. But it's fine. Everyone has their own taste, so, like, whatever. Actually, it turns out that this new addition to the family wasn't as bad as I thought. Max is an okay guy who never looks down on me or comments on my tomboy ways. And about my mom, her focus towards me decreased. I was basically invisible to her. Now she had Taylor around. You think I'd be mad jealous, huh? Actually, no. Not at all. I was glad of the peace. But then mom started comparing me to that brat, saying how I should be more like her as we were both girls, but I acted like a little demon. What? Taylor was so pathetic. She screamed when she saw a roach in the kitchen and refused to get down from the worktop until it had been removed. Don't even get me started on how she acted like she couldn't reach the top shelves in the school's library, so other boys had to help her. Ugh, sickening. Then things got heated when Taylor stormed into my room and asked me to come down for dinner. Well, I probably was playing my music too loudly to hear her knocking on my door. But still, she wasn't welcome here. Then she took a quick look around my room. Okay, I'm not exactly the most organized person, but I know exactly where things are. I asked her, what are you gopping at? Nothing, she bluffed. Hey. Why don't we go to the mall tomorrow? Let's go buy something cute. I need new clothes. And looks like you could use some help, too. I'm good, thanks. Crop tops aren't really my style. I'm not that much of a tryhard. I smirked at her. Oh, please. 
You wish you were like me. Look at yourself. You have the sense of fashion of a five-year-old boy. That's so childish. Who wears cargo pants anymore? Beats being a flamboyant ugly duckling who hides behind a zillion layers of pink glitter and foundation. Well, at least this ugly duckling will soon become a swan. But you, you're stuck being a nobody forever. No wonder mom hates you. I stared at her with hatred. Who was she to judge me in my own house? I needed to teach this brat a lesson. I charged towards her and yanked back her hair. She yelled at me to stop. Then at that moment, my mother appeared and shouted at me. Catherine, stop this at once. You need to grow up. Me? I shouted back. She just told me you don't love me. Well, she has a point. No one could love someone who acts like this. Look in the mirror. Taylor only said what we're all thinking. You're 17 already, for God's sakes. Grow up a little and give me a break. What was mom saying? She was taking the side of some random girl that only just moved in over her actual daughter? Great. There's zero use fighting with these close-minded morons. I let go of Taylor and pushed her and my mom out of my room, screaming at them, Fine! You two go and live happily ever after in your pink, fake, girly world! Then I slammed the door in their dumb faces. I was so done with them. I was so done with everything! Hi everyone, I'm Amanda, and I'm 17 years old. This is a story about how I fell in love with my adoptive dad and the crazy things I discovered because of it. I need to be honest, as I've not had the easiest life, so when I fell in love with him, I probably wasn't thinking straight. My childhood was tough, as it was just me and my mom, and we lived in a slum in the city. My mom was pretty irritable, and she always took it out on me when she'd had too much to drink. I got used to it quickly, and hardly even cried when she did this. I just thought it was normal to be treated like this. But when I was seven, my mom got arrested for fraud and drug use, and she got sentenced to ten years in prison. I'll never forget the moment the police broke our door down and took my mom away. It was late at night, and I just screamed and cried. All I had was my mom. Without her, I was nobody. Even though she hurt me when she was drunk, she was still my mom, and I loved her so much, and she loved me too. After she was taken away, and the police said I wouldn't see her for a while, social services placed me in an orphanage. Life there was even worse than in the slum with my mom, but I told myself it was only 10 years, and that as soon as my mom was released from prison, she'd come get me, and that by then, she'd have changed and wouldn't hit me anymore. But that's not what happened. After one year, an old couple came to adopt me. They'd been trying to have a baby for years with no luck. I thought maybe this was my chance to finally have a loving home. They cried with happiness when they saw me, but the minute we got back to their house, everything went downhill. They were both quite old and strict, and immediately sat me down and went over their set of rules. It was torture. Anytime I did one thing wrong, like accidentally breaking a glass or spilling some soy sauce on the table, they'd punish me by starving me for the whole day, until I almost fainted. After three months of this, they took me back to the orphanage and complained that I was a spoiled little brat with no manners. To be honest though, I was relieved. They were old and grumpy, and we clearly weren't well suited. Years passed by, and when I was 12, I was adopted by another family who ran a small restaurant. I stupidly thought it would be better this time, and at first it was, but pretty soon they started making me help out in the restaurant, doing all their chores and even the housework at home. I very quickly realized they'd basically just adopted me so I could be their maid. But there was one nice thing about this family, their son. His name was Jose and he was two years older than me. Unlike his parents, he was actually super kind. He would often steal food from me from the kitchen and even helped me finish the chores. But one time, his mom saw Jose helping me and thought I'd forced him into it. She was so angry at me, she took me straight back to the orphanage. I couldn't believe it. After four years, they just sent me back. After those two disastrous attempts at being adopted, I thought I'd never find a family who actually wanted me. I pretty much gave up all hope and resigned myself to the fact that I just have to endure the orphanage life until my mom got let out of prison. But then, one day, 
a man named James came to the orphanage to volunteer, and that's when my life changed. He looked quite young, around 40 or so, and he had a kind smile. Often, I'd catch him looking at me, and it made me feel quite shy. No one had ever paid me attention like this before, not even my mom. Then one day, the women who worked at the orphanage took me aside and told me that James wanted to adopt me. I told them I wasn't interested, and then I went to my room. Honestly, I was sick and tired of these foster families who just used me. I didn't want to go through that again. The next day, I was sitting on the swing in the garden of the orphanage when James came over. I got up off the swing and was about to leave when he asked if we could sit and talk a little bit. I was really hesitant, but he had such a kind face and I felt bad being rude. He then showed me a photo of a woman and a child, and I couldn't believe how much the child looked like me when I was younger. He told me that they were his wife and his daughter, but that they had died in a car accident eight months ago, and that he still couldn't get over the loss. So he'd been coming to the orphanage to volunteer, and now he felt ready to adopt someone. Then he looked at me and said, As soon as I saw you, Amanda, I knew you were the one I wanted to adopt. I didn't know what to say. I felt so sorry for him, and I knew what it felt like to experience loss. So I told him I'd be happy if he wanted to adopt me. He was so excited, and the very next day, he came to pick me up and take me to my new home. I was quite nervous, but as soon as I saw how cozy the house was, covered in family photos, and with a nice bedroom for me, I knew I'd made the right decision. James was the perfect adoptive dad. He was polite and kind and always listened to me. He didn't make me do chores, and he didn't create a strict set of rules for me to follow. With him, I could just be myself, and for the first time in years, I was happy. He made me laugh so much. Finally, life was good. But there was just one little problem. You see, I was a teenage girl, and the more time I spent with James, the more I started to think I liked him in a way that wasn't appropriate for a relationship between an adoptive dad and his daughter. One night, he was getting out of the shower, and he'd left the door open. I saw him standing there, wearing a towel around his waist, and I couldn't take my eyes off him. I knew it was wrong to be looking, but I just couldn't stop. Then one day, he was doing some gardening, and he hurt his back. I offered to give him a massage, and he was so grateful. As I rubbed his back with oil, he said to me, Oh, Amanda, your hands are so soft. I haven't felt so comfortable in a long time. I was glad he couldn't see my face, because I was blushing like crazy. Afterwards, he offered to give me a foot massage, but I said no because I didn't think I'd be able to handle it. I liked him so much, and that night, I went to bed wondering if he liked me too. And then one night, he asked if he could read me a bedtime story. Even though I was 16, he said he'd always read to his daughter and he missed it. So I said sure he could. And then, you won't believe it, he fell asleep next to me, in my bed. I barely slept a wink that night. I just watched him as he slept and had to stop myself from reaching out to stroke his hair. I so badly wanted to tell him how I felt. But for now, this was enough. Just being close to him and getting to have a peaceful life together. Little did I know that our peace was about to be disrupted. A woman moved in next door to us. Her name was Rosa, and she was seriously gorgeous. After she'd unpacked, we went over to say hi, and straight away, I regretted it. She immediately started flirting with James, even reaching out and stroking his arm as she said, Oh my, look at those muscles. I'll need your help setting up my kitchen, if you don't mind. James just laughed and said he'd be happy to help. As we walked away, I looked back and saw Rosa checking out James, and I knew she was going to be trouble. And sure enough, after that first meeting, she kept popping up. The next day, she asked James to help her fix a light bulb, and then a few days later, she came over with a plate of muffins to thank him. She never really spoke to me. She only had eyes for James, and I didn't like it one bit. Was she trying to steal him from me? The more she hung around, the more jealous I became. Everything had been perfect until she turned up, and now I was so scared James would fall for her and I'd be all alone again. My feelings were becoming so intense, so I decided there was only one thing for it. I had to tell him how I felt. I was pretty sure he had feelings for me too. I had to act quick, before Rosa made a move.
Hey, Alex. I felt someone tap on my shoulder. I turned around to see who it was and, huh, it was Roxy, my crush, who also happened to be the most beautiful girl in the world. I figured I must have been in her way, so I quickly mumbled out, sorry, and stepped aside. But out of my surprise, she smiled at me and said, So, a little birdie told me you like me? You know I think it's cute you haven't made a move on me yet, not like most of the guys around here. I stared at her open-mouthed. Was I dreaming? I pinched myself to check. Nope, this was real. So I nodded my head and muttered out, Um, yeah? My friend's having a party at their frat house on Wednesday. You want to come? Before I could reply, her friend Luke appeared, and grinning, he said, Yeah, you just gotta come to this party. Roxy hit his arm while giving him a dirty look, then smiled at me. So, it's at number 19. Starts at 9 p.m. I'll see you then? I nodded in response, and she said, Great, see you there. Then she winked at me before she walked off. So, yeah, I'm Alex, your average second-year college student. And this is the story about how my crush tried to lure me into a seriously sinister trap. I guess I'm a normal guy. I'm not as rich and popular as the kids from the frat houses are. Instead, my room is in the regular dorms. And although I'm not ugly or unpopular or anything, I'm easily overlooked. So I kept my crush on Roxy a secret because she was way out of my league. She was so beautiful, this was crazy. How did she even find out that I liked her? I couldn't believe that she'd asked me out. This was mad. At first, I felt like the luckiest guy ever. But then as I watched Roxy walk back to her friends, I noticed them giggling, except for this one girl called Sophie. Meanwhile, Luke was making everyone high-five him. He was always a little odd, and he spoke to people in strange ways. Then I caught Sophie's eye, and she gave me a look that said, Don't. Then she promptly looked away. Her jerky boyfriend Jack had his arm around her shoulder and was tugging on one of her trademark pigtails as he glugged back his drink. I had no idea what she saw in him. But what had her look been about? Back in my dorm, I discussed it with my roommate, Ben. And he said it sounded like a setup. As much as I wanted it to be legit, my gut instinct was also saying that it was too good to be true. So the night of the party, I decided to take a look out my dorm window, as it's in the perfect location to get a clear view of the frat houses. I counted the houses down to number 19. Then I took out my binoculars, for which I use for field research studies to take a closer look. The house had a large rainbow pride flag hanging from the two windows. This made me wonder why Roxy would want to go to a gay party. I saw a lot of feminine dressed men and the only two girls that I could spot were far from attractive. And it seemed like they were a couple. And then there was Luke in the front yard holding two drinks and looking around like he was waiting for someone. Where was Roxy? I decided to check her social media to see if she'd posted anything. And I noticed she'd left her location open. She was in a nightclub, Diego's. Huh, that was strange. So I gave the party a miss, and instead Ben and I went to a student bar. I told him about it, and he said it sounded like I dodged a bullet. The next day I was sitting with Ben and some of my other friends in the canteen when Roxy stormed over to me and yelled out, How dare you stand me up? Who do you think you are? Luke appeared and said, Yeah, why not show? I just shrugged and said, Roxy, I know you weren't there. Your phone location's public. You were at Diego's. She hesitated, then said, Um, yeah, my friend borrowed my phone. But what you did was so creepy, you stalker. (laughs) As if. Roxy was never without her phone, so I wasn't buying her story. This whole thing didn't make any sense, so I sort of mouthed out, whatever, Roxy, then carried on eating my lunch. After that, she started making my life a living hell. She told everyone that I was stalking her, so random students started coming up to me and telling me to leave her alone. Then someone covered the dorm corridors in leaflets with a picture of my face and the word stalker written across them. I knew Roxy was behind it. It was so weird. But Luke was worse. One time after class, he sneaked up on me, grabbed my arm, and said, Hey, Alex, why you bail on my party? I told him that I saw the party from a distance, and it wasn't my thing. So he replied, Hey, you got a probs with me being gay? I shook my head and told him I didn't, but he still wouldn't let go of my arm. I was relieved when he finally let go of me, and I hurried back to my dorm. On the way, I spotted Sophie sitting outside on the shared bathroom. Hang on, why was she in the flood of tears? I asked her if she was okay, but she told me to go away. Although I didn't want to put my nose where it shouldn't be. But I I wasn't heartless, so I left her my bottle of water before I walked off. I said, if you want to talk about it, I'm here for you. I was unlocking my dorm room when I heard someone cough behind me. I turned around to see Sophie standing there. 
She thanked me for the water and she said she wanted to talk. I let her into my room and she sat on my bed. And staring at her feet, she said in tears, I caught Jack and Roxy by the locker rooms, but when I confronted them about it, they just shooed me away. I sat down next to Sophie and hugged her. This was horrible. It looks like I've been so wrong about Roxy. She wasn't my dream girl at all. Instead, she was a nightmare. Sophie continued. It gets worse. Roxy stole my assignment and submitted it as her own. It's due tomorrow and I don't have the time to write a new one. She started crying again. I passed her a tissue and said, We'll sort this out. There's no way she's getting away with it. That's horrible. So I told her to send an email to the college dean and to her course tutor explaining what happened. She'd attached the original assignment and all the notes she'd written about it. They both got back to us within minutes and said that they would look into this. Sophie looked so delighted, but then suddenly her smile dropped, and she fiddled with one of her pigtails as she said, Alex, uh, there's something I need to tell you. Please don't hate me. Then she told me how the party Roxy had invited me to had been a trap. Roxy found out I had a crush on her, and she was embarrassed that an average guy like me dared to have feelings toward her. And she was adamant she needed to teach me a lesson. So that's when Luke said he would help, as he wanted to add me to his collection. So they hatched a plan. Roxy invited me to the party, and Luke was waiting for me with a spiked drink. Apparently, this was Roxy's way of silencing me, and making sure I didn't look at her in the same way ever again. Whoa, this was so dark. I shivered at the thought of what could have been. It was terrifying. Sophie also told me that she begged Roxy not to do this, but she got her friends to hold her down. Then she told her that if she intervened, they'd make her suffer. I comforted Sophie and told her that it wasn't her fault. I knew I couldn't just stay quiet on this, as they could do this to some poor other guy who dared to have a crush on her. So with Sophie's help, we wrote a letter to the dean and to the college security about what had happened. This wasn't going to be taken lying down. Sophie was terrified that Roxy and her friends would come after her, so I invited her back to my hometown for the weekend to get away from everyone and let things cool down. When we arrived back at college, news spread that Roxy had been expelled for stealing another student's work. As for Luke, the cops raided his frat house and found loads of banned substances hidden in there. It was so serious that it went to court, and they ended up in jail. As for Jack, he tried to guilt trip Sophie as to why she should get Roxy expelled for dumb reasons, but she stopped talking to him anyway. I often think back to the night of the party and what could have been. My life would have been ruined, and what for? All because I dared to have a crush on a beautiful girl. <laughs> I say good riddance. Some good has come out of this whole mess. Sophie and I grew closer and started dating. Now we've both graduated, and that's not all. We have two amazing kids together. I love my beautiful family with all my heart, and I just want to protect them from all the bad in this world. So in short, I don't think that just because you're beautiful, rich, and popular, that you get to get away with doing whatever you please. Regardless of age, sex, looks, and so on, everyone deserves to be treated with respect and compassion. Have you ever questioned if your teacher hates you? I wish I didn't have to, but yep, my teacher hated my guts, and she went out of her way to make it very clear. I'm Lori, by the way. I'm 15 years old, and I guess you could say I kind of stand out because of my looks. People say I'm kind of pretty. Anyway, this year I started high school, although I only joined halfway through the year because I was off sick for six months with glandular fever. Yep, I had the dreaded mono. I was so tired of lying in bed feeling sorry for myself, so when the doctor said I could finally go back to school, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was in store for me. On my first day, I had to show all my teachers my hospital certificate to explain why I'd missed so much of the year. When I gave it to Miss Atkin, my math teacher, she smiled and said, Welcome. Nice to see you feeling so much better. I smiled back at her and said, Thank you. And I was about to walk away when suddenly she said, Excuse me, you're Lori Hannison? Her face looked all weird, and when I told her, Yep, that was me, Something inside her changed. She gave me a cold stare and told me to go to my seat immediately. I was confused a little bit about her attitude, but then I moved on from it. The most important thing was how I could catch up with my class. After missing six months of math, I was super behind and couldn't understand anything. My mom had to hire a tutor for me, and he was such a good teacher. Only after three months, I finally caught up with them. I had a notebook from our sessions with lots of notes inside, and whenever I couldn't remember something, I'd just look at it. 
Well, one day, I had it on my desk at school, and Miss Atkin caught me seeing my notes. She marched towards me, grabbed it, and slammed it down in front of me. She was so angry and got right up in my face and said, Never, ever bring another teacher's notes to my class. Do you hear me? As she said that, a little bit of spit flew out of her mouth and landed on my nose. I was horrified. Why was she so angry at me? It kind of scared me, and I thought maybe she was just angry because I wasn't as good at math as everyone else. After that, I didn't dare bring my notebook to class, but sometimes I still struggled, so I'd ask my friend who sat nearby to help me. Miss Atkin always caught me asking her and would put me in detention. One time I just sneezed too loud and she gave me detention. I mean, can you even believe? It annoyed me so much that I started to rebel. I'd often fall asleep in her class and I seriously lost all motivation to do well. And that's not all. One day I wore a new dress to class and I swear I looked exactly like all the other girls at school. But Miss Atkin publicly embarrassed me by making me stand up in front of everyone, then said, Girls and boys, Lori is a fine example of someone who pays more attention to what she wears than to studying. Don't be like Lori. I could feel myself blushing and I wanted to cry. She was deliberately being mean to me and I had no idea why. I was not that kind of girl. I normally loved studying, and I didn't care about clothes and shoes at all. I couldn't say anything, though, because if I spoke back to her, she'd give me a worse grade. What made it all even worse was that she was also the cheerleading coach, and she had her pack of cheerleaders following her around everywhere. One time, I was standing in the hall talking with my friend Joe. We'd been best friends since we were like three years old, and we also live in the same street, so we'd grown up together. Joe always had my back. So we were standing there chatting when Miss Atkin and some of her fave students walked by. Suddenly, I heard one of the girls say, Oh, look, surprise, surprise. It's Lori flirting with a boy again. Then one of the other girls said, Seriously, she's such a fake. I mean, she's using her illness to get attention from boys. How pathetic. I couldn't believe it. Did they think I was deaf or something? They were the ones who were fake with their thick layers of makeup and all of their gossip and drama. I didn't really care that they were saying these things, but what really got to me was the way Miss Atkin laughed along with them. I actually saw her nod her head, so she agreed with them. I knew that wasn't okay, and Joe saw it too. He was so angry and grabbed my hand and said we had to report her to the principal. I stopped him though and said, just leave it. I am still the new girl here and I don't want to cause any drama. And anyway, I have a plan. I smirked at him as I said this. So, Miss Atkin has this policy where if someone's phone rings in class, they have to answer it on speakerphone. And that policy includes her too. So that day, I pretended to bump into her as she entered the class and watched as her phone dropped out of her hands. I quickly picked it up and apologized for being so clumsy, but at the same time, I unmuted it when she wasn't looking. Easy peasy. You see, I'd arranged for Joe to call her. This was going to be hilarious. Sure enough, five minutes later, her phone started ringing loudly. Her ringtone was Beyonce's single ladies, and everyone burst out laughing. She freaked out and quickly grabbed her phone to cancel it. But Joe was persistent. He just kept calling, and everyone in class reminded her of the policy, so she had no choice but to answer it. Well, just wait for this. She answered, and suddenly Joe's voice filled the room. But he'd put on a funny accent to make himself sound older. Honey, don't forget about our secret date at our favorite hotel tonight. Miss Atkin looked like she wanted to die. She said, who is this? I don't know you. Then Joe said, come on, baby, what's up? Is your husband there? Miss Atkin was now visibly shaking and said, you've got the wrong number. But Joe wouldn't stop. Ah, uh, you're so cute. I'll see you tonight, baby. Get ready for a fun night, wink wink. At that, Miss Atkin hung up and the whole class was just deathly silent. I had to bite my tongue to stop myself from laughing. Joe had really outdone himself. However, I hadn't exactly thought it all through. Because a couple of days later, Joe and I were about to walk home when he got called into the principal's office. I went with him, but they wouldn't let me in. I could see Miss Atkin in the room along with the principal and Joe. She'd somehow found out that it was Joe who'd called her, and now the principal said that Joe would be expelled 
and that his parents would need to come in for a meeting the following day. Oh my god, this was all my fault. When he came out, I rushed over and started apologizing, but Joe said, Don't worry, I did it, so I'll take the responsibility. I was beside myself with guilt. I just kept saying, Joe, no, this is my fault. I'm the one who should be expelled. But Joe wouldn't even listen to me. Well, that evening, I told my parents the whole story. I was crying as I told them, and obviously they were angry, but they were also supportive. The next day, Joe's parents came for their meeting. The principal was there, and the school board, and of course, Miss Atkin. Luckily, my parents arrived just in time to interrupt the meeting, and we burst into the room. We told them the truth, how I'd been so ill and had to get a tutor, and that's why I carry that notebook. Then how Miss Atkin had treated me so badly and been so rude to me the whole time. I told them the phone call incident had been my fault and that Joe had just wanted to help me. Suddenly, Miss Atkins stood up and pointed at me and said, I knew it was you. You spoiled brat. You should be expelled. What happened next was crazy. My mom jumped up and said, How dare you speak to my daughter like that? You hate her because she's my daughter. Get over it, Angela. It's been years. Well, Miss Atkin ran towards my mom and said, You're a horrible woman. And so is your daughter. You deserve each other. She was about to grab my mom, but my dad jumped up and stopped her. I didn't understand what was happening. Everyone was so shocked. The principal looked so puzzled. Then he told us all to go home and calm down. When we got home, my mom sat me down and said, If you're being mistreated, you need to tell us. Don't suffer it out alone, okay? I told my mom I was fine and that school was great. But then my dad interrupted and said, You're fine? Don't lie to us. You were almost expelled. Then my mom said, Honey, calm down. It's not her fault. You saw her teacher. She's a demon. Then my dad just laughed and... I was so confused. Then he said, Oh yeah, Lori, we should have told you this already, but Miss Atkin was at school with us. Then they told me how the three of them had gone to high school together, and both my mom and Miss Atkin had a crush on my dad, so they became sworn enemies. They fought all the time, and Miss Atkin had been expelled from school because of my mom. Of course, my dad hadn't known all of that back then, and he'd fallen in love with my mom. Wow, now I understand the real reason Miss Atkin treated me like that. She was obviously still angry at my mom, and when she'd seen my name, she hadn't been able to control her anger anymore, and she'd just released it all on me. My mom said, Lori, you look exactly like me in high school. Because I was pretty, so many people were jealous. <laughs> Then she turned to my dad, smiled, and said, I can see that Joe is quite similar to your dad. You should be careful. At that, mom and I burst out laughing. My dad was just speechless. And guess what? It all worked out in the end. Miss Atkin got reassigned to another school, and Joe and I were only suspended from school for two weeks. Now we're closer than ever, and there's definitely some real chemistry between us. Finally, high school is getting good again, huh? Hi. I'm Diane, and I'm 20 years old. I fell in love on the first day of college. I'm not even joking. I'd promised my mom I'd focus on my studies and wouldn't fall for any boys. But one look at Brett, and I broke that promise immediately. We had an instant connection, and pretty soon we were spending every waking moment together. I can't help but think that if I hadn't met him, Maybe I'd never have found out the dark secret my mom and aunt had been hiding from me my whole life. You see, my mom raised me alone, and I had no idea who my dad was. Let's just say it seemed like my mom got around, so she really didn't want me to get into the same kind of situation as her. I decided to keep Brett a secret. She didn't need to know, right? When I went home for Christmas vacation, I missed Brett so much, but I couldn't let my mom know about him. So I'd wait until she went to bed before calling him. One night, she caught me, though. She must have gone to the bathroom, and suddenly I heard footsteps. She was standing right there. I didn't know how much she heard, but I was so embarrassed. I thought she'd grab the phone from me and tell me off. But instead, she just walked back to bed. It was so weird. In the morning, she was sitting at the kitchen table, grinning, and said, Well, who is he then? Invite him over. Don't be shy. I couldn't believe it. I thought she'd freak out, but instead she wanted to meet him. She suggested we invited him over for dinner, as my aunt was also coming over that night. 
My mom and my aunt were like best friends and had basically raised me together, so I was excited for her to meet Brett too. He took the bus that afternoon, as he was desperate to see me, and my mom said he could stay in the spare room. As soon as my mom saw Brett, she grinned at me and whispered how handsome he was. Then we sat down to dinner and started chatting. My mom had so many questions for him, and it was a bit awkward. She wouldn't shut up, and it made her seem so nosy. She asked where he'd grown up, and what his mom and dad did, and even asked for their names and stuff. Meanwhile, my aunt just sat there quietly, and then at one point she got up from the table and went out into the garden. My mom ran after her, and Brett looked at me worried. I had no idea what was wrong. Ten minutes later, my mom came in and her expression had totally changed. She went from being warm and friendly to totally strict and cold. She looked at both Brett and I and said she decided I was far too young to have a boyfriend staying over, and then asked Brett to leave. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was 20 years old. She was being so rude. So I said to her, Mom, why? Please, can he just stay? I was almost begging her, but she looked so serious and firm, and I knew she wasn't going to change her mind. Brett was even more shocked than me. I mean, it had been my mom who'd invited him in the first place, and now there she was, shooing him away. He quickly grabbed his stuff and ordered a taxi. I was so upset I didn't even say bye to him. I just burst into tears and felt so angry at my mom. Right after Brett left, I ran upstairs and locked myself in my room, and my mom stood on the other side begging to speak to me. She said there was something she needed to tell me. I refused to come out and instead sat on the floor on the other side of the door. I could hear my mom crying and knew this was serious. She said the reason she didn't want Brett to stay was because he was actually my half-brother. No, I didn't understand. I asked if my dad was also Brett's dad, and then I got angry. I thought my mom hadn't known who my dad was. I opened the door and I was about to start shouting at her when she told me what was really going on. I'd been adopted. Well, actually, I'd been kidnapped by my aunt when I was born. It's a long, shocking story, but basically my biological parents were this rich couple, but they were struggling to get pregnant. My biological mom had a best friend called Ashley, who she told everything to, but Ashley secretly had a crush on my dad. She seduced my dad until one night they slept together, and Ashley ended up getting pregnant. My dad was so happy and promised Ashley he'd help raise the baby, but that he couldn't divorce my mom. This made Ashley angry. She wanted my dad all to herself, and wanted their kid to become the heir to his company. At the same time, my biological mom fell pregnant with me, and when my dad found out, he quickly forgot about Ashley and tried to forget about the mistake he'd made that one night. This, of course, made Ashley even more angry, but she still pretended to be friends with my mom. When my mom went into labor with me, my dad was away on a business trip, and Ashley paid someone to sneak into the hospital and kidnap me. That person turned out to be my aunt. She did it because she was desperate for cash— so she snuck in, dressed up as a nurse, and in the middle of the night stole me away. But she wasn't cold-blooded enough to just throw me away or leave me at an orphanage. So she took me to her sister's place and told her that she'd found me abandoned on the street. Her sister, who had never wanted to get married but had always wanted to be a mom, was so happy and decided to raise me. But then a few days later it was all over the news, a missing baby. There was an exact description of what I'd been wearing, and even a photo of me just after I'd been born. There was no denying that I was the missing baby. My new mom confronted my aunt about it and found out the truth. My aunt said there was no way they could return me as my aunt had already spent all the money she'd been paid to cover some debts. And she didn't want to go to prison, so they decided to raise me as if I really was their own. That secret would still have been hidden from me if I hadn't brought Brett home. My mom was so shocked that I'd brought my dad and Ashley's son into her home and introduced him to her as my boyfriend. As my mom told me all of this, I just sat there frozen. This was absolutely unbelievable. I felt sick. They'd lied to me all these years. And even worse, my boyfriend was actually my half-brother. My whole life was one big mess. I hate you, Mom, and I hate you too, I said to my aunt. 
You helped that evil monster Ashley get what she wanted, and now you've ruined my life and taken away my family. My mom reached out to hug me, but I didn't want her near me. We both just sat there crying. She tried to calm me down and get me to relax. Then she sighed and said, I'm sorry. I'm truly sorry. Your whole life, I've been trying to make it up to you. I thought my love for you would be enough. As for Ashley, well, I heard she didn't get what she wanted in the end. Wait, why? I don't understand. But she successfully kidnapped me, right? I wiped my tears and looked at her. Yes, sweetie, but her main goal was to become your dad's wife. But that obviously didn't happen. Then she continued. After my aunt had kidnapped me, Ashley had given birth to Brett and was so happy thinking that my parents no longer had a baby and that my dad would now leave my mom and go live with her. But that's not what happened. Yes, their dear daughter was taken away, but my dad still stayed with my mom and loved her even more. My dad didn't get together with Ashley, but apparently my dad had still been helping raise Brett until now. There's definitely no bad blood between them because I've heard Brett talk about his dad quite a lot. Now there was only one thing for it. I had to find my biological parents and find out the rest of the story. They deserved to know I was alive. But now, what would I do about Brett? I'd have to break up with him somehow. First century and all, but I only reached this conclusion through experience. My ex Carrie was friends with this super annoying guy called Chris. They'd known each other for years, but it was obvious he liked her. I saw how gooey-eyed he was around her. She was so insistent that there was nothing going on between them, but guess what? After we broke up, it didn't take long for them to go official on social media. After that, I started dating this awesome girl called Lily. I didn't even mind the fact that there were a few guys in her group, as I eventually befriended them all too. They're all nice, and especially this one guy Todd seems like a cool dude. We played basketball together and chatted about video games. Lily didn't like me talking to him, though. She said she found it weird that I was so friendly with him. And she'd rather I wasn't. Whatever, I just put this down to the fact that girls could be weird sometimes. Okay, so maybe Lily didn't seem to like Todd all that much. She never sat by him or really spoke to him. It was probably just some ridiculous girl drama thing. So I continued to chat with Todd as normal. He was a genuine guy who did nice things. Such as when Lily got super drunk at some party, he was the one who called me up to come and get her. And then he stayed up with her until I arrived. I actually kind of felt sorry for Todd. As the rest of the group all had partners, so he was left being the gooseberry. Once, when me and Lily were feeding each other strawberries and being all lovey-dovey, I noticed how glum he looked. Suddenly, an idea popped into my head. I should help him find a girlfriend. So I have this one friend called Gemma. She's sweet and pretty, but she can be a little on the overbearing side. She's always sneaking candy bars in my backpack with sticky notes on them saying, Enjoy, love, G, X. And she likes every single picture I post on social media pages. I've told her I'm not interested in her like that as I'm with Lily, but she always just smiles and says, I know that, silly. Anyway, Todd struck me as the kind of guy who may like a candy-giving, slightly clingy girl. So on a group outing to the cinema, I told him how I felt bad for him being the only single one in the group, and how I had this friend who'd be perfect for him. At first, he shook his head and said, thanks, but no thanks, as he wasn't looking for a girlfriend right now. I wasn't taking no for an answer. So the next week, I bombarded him with messages all about how amazing Gemma was. In the end, he agreed to go on a date with her. And afterwards, he messaged me, thanking me for setting it up and telling me how he'd had a great time. Result? Just call me Dr. Love, please. Oh, you're welcome. My relationship with Lily was going great. So when she said she was going away for the night with her friends, I told her this was cool as I trusted her and I trusted them. Then at 3 a.m. when I was shooting zombies on my game, my phone buzzed. It was Todd. We've been playing Truth or Dare. Sorry, but I think you need to hear this. This was followed by a voice message. My heart sank, as in a tipsy voice I heard Lily say, Before loving Ryan, I actually had feelings for another guy, and I kind of still do now be... The recording ended there. Not that it mattered, as I'd heard enough. My girlfriend liked someone else. Then Todd messaged me. 
Sorry for that, bro. Thought you deserved the heads up. I thanked him for his honesty. I knew it must have been hard for him to call out Lily. As I saw it, he was a really good guy with the right intentions. For obvious reasons that night, I couldn't sleep at all. So the next morning, I got up early and went for a jog to try and clear my mind fog. That's when Gemma rang me up and asked me out on a picnic. I agreed. I figured that it'd be moping around, all miserable. By the time I arrived back from my jog, Gemma was already parked outside of my dorm, a smile on her face and a picnic basket in hand. I commented on how quick she'd packed it, and she blushed and mentioned something about female intuition. I stank, so I went and showered quickly. Then, as I was getting into Gemma's car, Lily messaged me, telling me she'd be back by noon and I should come over for lunch. But I'm not in any mood to deal with her just yet. So I messaged her, saying I was busy with an assignment. The picnic was great. It was such a sunny day, and Gemma filled the basket with all of my favorite treats. I arrived back feeling positive about things. So what if Lily had a crush on another guy? It didn't mean she didn't love me, right? So I went over to Lily's place, but when she opened the door, she just scowled at me and said, Oh, it's you. Of course it was me. Who else would it be? I followed her inside, but her mood only worsened. I tried asking her about her trip, but she answered with shrugs and eye rolls. Feeling annoyed, I asked her what her problem was. Then she just went into full rage mode and shouted at me. What's my problem? Why don't we talk about you? Where have you been today? Don't think you can lie to me. Then she showed me on her phone, and on the screen was one of Gemma's posts about how she'd had a lovely picnic with me. We're just friends, Lily, you know that. You spent all night with your guy friends, and I didn't moan about it. Well, I know she likes you, and now you're just hanging out with her behind my back. Fueled by anger, I yelled at her. So what? You're not really innocent either. I know you prefer some other guy over me. Well, then I suggest you go and date him instead. What? Whatever. You know what? Fine. Maybe I will. Yeah, well, I think you should. I stormed out of there and charged up the street. By the time I arrived back at my dorm, the reality dawned on me that I'd just broken up with the love of my life. Jeez, this sucked. From then on, whenever I saw Lily around campus, she totally ignored me. It was the worst feeling ever. Todd messaged me a lot to check if I was okay. I kind of hoped he could help me get back with Lily, but I was getting some seriously weird vibes from him. Once, he even sent a message saying, you're an amazing guy and you're way too good for Lily anyway. Okay, weird. Did he have a crush on me? That would explain why Lily was wary of me making friends with him. Worse still, I had Gemma hanging around me like some sort of limpet. Because I was lonely, I agreed to go for a coffee with her. She left her phone on the table when she went to the toilet. It beeped, so I looked at it. And that's when I saw that Todd had a picture of her, of him holding Lily in her arms, with the caption, Hey, look, I've succeeded. You two quickly finish your quest, although maybe we should pass on the double date. As Gemma walked back over, I waved the picture in front of her and said, I think you have some explaining to do. The color drained from her face, but she gave me a feeble nod. It turns out that on her date with Todd, they discussed how she was crazy about me and how he was into Lily. Then Todd had shown Gemma the messages I'd sent him, telling him how great she was and why I thought he should date her. So he made out I must secretly like her and suggested they come up with a plan to split us up. There I was, thinking Todd was my friend, but turns out the whole time he was an evil genius. Crying, Gemma played me the full voice message that Todd had sent her from that night. Before loving Ryan, I actually had feelings for another guy. And I still kind of do now, but it doesn't matter, as I've decided that Ryan's the guy for me. Besides, some of you have probably noticed that the other guy, well, it's Todd. We're just friends, though, so let's leave it be. I told Gemma to stay away from me. Then I stormed out of there. She shouted after me, but I ignored her, and I've been ignoring her ever since. So, there we go. In the end, opposite-sex friendships never bring any good. I wanted to believe that guys and girls could just be friends, but clearly, they can't. I've given this a lot of thought, and decided to tell Lily everything, as she deserves to know what a cruel and conniving guy Todd is. I don't know how she'll react, but I know I have to let her know, right? I hope she gives me another chance, but it might be too late. Todd tore us apart with his mind games, and I stood by and let him. Jeez, I miss her. Wish me luck. Hi guys, I'm Austin, and I'm a 23-year-old college student. I guess my school years went by pretty smoothly, as I had my best friend Jake by my side. When we're not partying and living large, me and him would work part-time at this local restaurant. The pay was pretty dismal, 
but it funded some fun nights out at least. My story starts as many do, with a cute girl. And I'm talking Ariana Grande pretty. Me and Jake first spotted her one day in the coffee shop that we always dropped by on our way to work. Neither of us could quit staring at her. She must have noticed us too, as instead of leaving, she turned back, smiled in our direction, then walked over to the counter and ordered another drink to go. She was obviously doing this because she wanted to talk to me, so I rushed over there to start a convo. The problem was Jake tagged along too and offered to pay for her drink. Ugh. She seemed flattered, smiled, then thanked us both. Then I was about to ask her for her number, but she rushed off as she said, Gotta go. My Uber's here. It was such a bummer. All I knew about her was that she was the hottest girl ever. And her name was Darcy. Well, that was the name written on her takeout cup. Feeling a bit deflated, me and Jake walked back to our table. But as we passed the table she'd been sitting at, we saw a phone. I presumed it was hers, and she left it there. So I lunged for it before Jake could. He looked so annoyed. Ha! Now the chance to see her again is mine. The phone was locked, but I was sure she'd call any minute now. I wanted to wait for her to come back and look for it, but I had to get to work. I kept the phone in the pocket of my apron throughout my shift. You know, just in case she called. And also so Jake wouldn't get his hands on it and try and steal my girl. During our break time, I sat down with Jake and we looked at the phone for a bit. Yeah, I know it was locked, so there wasn't much to see. However, even on the lock screen, we could see there was a picture of a brunette girl. Why would she have another girl as her wallpaper, though? Could this be her girlfriend or something? Nah, I seriously needed to quit overthinking. I'd seen the way she smiled at me. She totally liked me. This probably was just an old picture of her when she had brown hair. Finally, as I was finishing my shift, the phone rang. I cleared my throat, then in my sexiest voice answered with a, Hey there. Only to my surprise, she started screaming at me, calling me a thief. I tried explaining that she'd got it all wrong, and I'd meet her at the coffee shop to settle things down. She sounded so cranky, and not at all like the mild-mannered girl from earlier. Then again, I would have acted crazy too if I lost my phone. After the shift, me and Jake walked back to the coffee shop, and as we approached the place... I pulled out my phone and called the number earlier to ask where she was waiting. But then I saw a big guy pick up his phone instead. I was terrified, so I shoved Darcy's phone to Jake and told him to go return it. He didn't know anything and excitedly grabbed it and ran over, only to be stopped by that guy in front of the coffee shop. He asked, aren't you the one who stole my phone? Jake was puzzled and looked at me for help, and we just mumbled out that it wasn't, that it was some pretty girl's phone. She left it behind so we thought we would find some way to give it back to her. Then the man said, No, it's not any pretty girl's phone. Don't be sly. We've looked at the CCTV and saw what you did. It was a mess. So are you telling me that we couldn't see our dream girl again, but be caught up in this stealing chaos instead? This sucks. Things got even worse when this big guy put Jake in a headlock. Luckily, a woman walked toward him and said, It's okay, Tim. We can talk this out. Well... He wasn't wrong anyway. I am a pretty girl. I'll take care of it from here. Then she gestured to him to go wait in the car and leave us three alone. She told us her name was Chelsea and that the scary looking guy was her younger brother. She gave us a chance to explain what happened. Then she told us what was shown on the surveillance cameras. In the end, we realized what actually happened. While we'd been talking to Darcy at the counter, Chelsea and her brother must have come in and sat at the table Darcy had been at. Then they quickly changed their minds and switched tables, but Chelsea left her phone there by mistake. Once this Chelsea girl realized it was all a misunderstanding, she kept on twirling her hair around her finger, and I'm sure I saw her wink at me. Was she flirting with us? I mean, she was kind of cute, but she's surely older than us, like around 30-ish. Then she said, so how about we go hang out sometime? As I see it, you owe me a coffee at least. Was she being serious? I couldn't go on a date with her. I don't feel comfortable dating someone that much older than me. And what about Darcy? She's all I had in mind right now. I mean, I could always go and tell my brother that you guys really stole my phone, she smirked. Was she joking or being serious? I didn't know, and I wasn't going to chance it. So I spluttered out, sure, coffee will be good. We exchanged phone numbers with her. Later, she texted us to set up the times and places. 
I didn't want to meet her. So on the day of the date, I phoned Jake up and feigned being sick and told him he'd have to go alone. To my surprise, he didn't seem to mind. Instead, he sounded excited about it. Then, after the date, he came straight to my dorm, saying he wanted to check up on me, but I knew it's just an excuse. All he did was go on and on with me about how much fun Chelsea was, and that she was rich in stuff, so it wasn't just a simple coffee date, but she took him to this fancy restaurant too. I didn't expect Jake would be like that. I'm glad he enjoyed it though. Anything so I wouldn't have to go on a date with her. This went on for a while, and soon they seemed pretty serious. Whenever Jake spoke about her, he went all gooey eyes. So my boy was in love. She clearly cared about him too, and made it so he didn't have to work at the restaurant anymore. I was happy for Jake. I truly was. And also relieved I didn't have to date Chelsea. But I also felt down about it all. He was in love while my dream girl was out there somewhere. And I didn't know how to find her. And that's when my luck changed. I was at work carrying the drinks over to a table, when to my surprise, I saw that Darcy was sitting there. I must have been gawping at her as she laughed and said, Hey, the Coke's mine. Blushing, I passed her the Coke, then said, I don't know if you remember, um, but we met a few weeks ago in the coffee shop around the corner. Sure, she smiled. It's nice to meet you again, coffee boy. She was so cute and sweet. There's no way I could let her slip through my fingers again. So I checked to make sure my boss wasn't looking. Then I asked Darcy for her number. She wrote it on a napkin and passed it to me on her way out. I was so excited, I fist-pumped the air. Through our messages, I discovered she just started an internship around the corner, and she really wanted to impress them so they'd offer her an official job. I was happy as this meant I would get to see her loads. Every time she came into the restaurant, I tried my best to make a move with her without letting my boss notice. One time, I gave her a free dessert, then said, Something sweet for the sweetest girl I know. Cheesy, I know, but girls love that kind of stuff. There were sparks flying everywhere. I knew she felt it too. I just needed to find the courage to ask her out. Then one day, suddenly Chelsea texted me, asking why I never came to see her. I thought this was odd. So I replied that I thought her and Jake were kind of official now. To my surprise, she replied, Come on, you still haven't properly made it up to me after stealing my phone. You know the cops wouldn't be too happy to hear that either, right? Or I could just tell my brother. I didn't want to get in trouble with either her giant of a brother or the cops, so yeah, I agreed to go on a date with her. We met at the same coffee shop where this whole phone drama started, as she said it was close to her work. This time, she introduced herself as the marketing manager of some big company. Wow, okay, that's impressive for her age. She's beautiful and successful. Maybe I really have been a bit rude to this respectable woman, so I decided to sit back and hear her out. But the next minute, she was like, Austin, I've loved you since first sight. She grabbed my hand. Jake's a sweet guy, but he's not you. What? She didn't even know me. She was crazy. And how could she do this to Jake? Then suddenly a group of people walked into the cafe. She said they were her employees and waved them over, then told them, everyone, this is my boyfriend, Austin. I glared at her, but I had no choice but to awkwardly greet everyone just to get it over with as quick as possible. But then I saw a familiar face in the crowd. No way. Hi, I'm Ella, and I'm 17. Have you ever been brave enough to change the things that you were too familiar with? If yes, did you encounter any difficulties? Well, for me, yeah. It's more than just changes. And this is the story of what happened to me last summer. And it's really crazy, so brace yourself. So, I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. When I say small, I mean it. It only had a population of 85 people. There was just one gas station, two small parks, one grocery store, and, oh yeah, only one school. Including me, there were only seven kids in my grade. That's right, seven people. And my grade was one of the biggest ones. From when I was five years old to the time I was 15, I spent most of my time with the same six classmates. After being with them for many years, most of them really started to get on my nerves. Well, apart from Rosie. Rosie and I became BFFs in third grade. Some other kids were teasing me about my red hair and told me that I looked like a tomato. 
but then Rosie appeared by my side and told them to back off. From then on, we became best friends and were pretty much inseparable. My life was good. I felt safe in my little town where everyone knew each other. In a city, there were way too many people for my liking and too much pressure to be popular. And I didn't want that. I knew a small town life was the life for me. But then, when I was 16, everything changed. On one Saturday afternoon, I was at Rosie's house watching a movie when my parents called me and told me to come home at once. I thought this was kind of weird because my parents didn't usually call me to come home until it was late at night. And right now it was only 4.30 p.m. What did they need me to come home for? I arrived home to find Jake, my brother, crying. I bursted out loud. What happened? What was going on? Seeing me totally in shock, my dad said, Ella, we have some news. What news was bad enough to make my brother, who wasn't the emotional type, cry? Did someone have a serious illness? Had someone died? Oh no. Had my beloved dog Sally died? Then he said, Ella, I've been offered a job in New York City. What? I yelled. And he's taking it. This is an amazing opportunity for us all. And moving out of this town will be good for us. It'll be a great adventure, Mom said. New York? The biggest city in the entire country? No, I couldn't move there. I didn't want a new adventure. I was perfectly happy where we live now, and I didn't want to leave. But however much I sulked, shouted, or pleaded with my parents to stay, their minds were made up, and we were moving. Telling Rosie was horrible. She got so upset, and I felt awful about it. I didn't want to leave her, but what choice did I have? I spent my last day in town with her. We ate pizza, watched our favorite movies, played our favorite video games, and things like that. When it was time for me to leave, I gave her my unicorn plushie to remember me by. Then we cried into each other's arms and we promised to text each other every single day. So, I left the safety of my little town and moved to the city. Our new house was much smaller than my old one, but at least we could keep Sally. On my first day of school, I was terrified. There were so many people and I didn't know where I was meant to go or what I was meant to do. Luckily, the kids there were actually really nice. This one girl showed me where my locker was, and some other kids let me sit with them at lunchtime. After only a few weeks of living in New York, I started to find my bearings. I even figured out how to navigate the underground. I made some pretty great friends, but this didn't change the fact that Rosie was still my BFF. I texted her every day, and sometimes we spent hours on the phone with each other. A month of city life passed, and I got talking to this boy in my English class called Alex. He had the most amazing blonde hair, and his eyes, they were blue like the sky and the ocean and a swimming pool and, yeah, if you couldn't tell, I really liked Alex. Not only was he unbelievably cute, but he was also kind and funny. We bonded over our love of video games and dogs and soon became pretty close. Then one day, he invited me over to his apartment to hang out. Then over a giant pizza and a movie, he told me he liked me and asked me to be his girlfriend. I instantly said yes! I was so excited and couldn't wait to tell Rosie, but she didn't seem all that thrilled about it. For a few months, everything was perfect for me. School life was great and I had some awesome friends and an amazing boyfriend. Sadly though, Rosie and I grew further apart. I barely had time to talk to her hours on the phone every night. It was like our timeline became different. She always called when I was busy, and when I texted her back, she wasn't there. I know that she always cared about me, but my busy life just carried me away. I told myself this was okay as things change. People get different friends. Though not as often as before, Rosie and I still chatted whenever we had a chance. One time I told her that I would be going out with Alex at a fancy restaurant the next day. Anytime I mentioned Alex, she seemed not cool with it. But that time she expressed her excitement and asked me a lot about our date. That made me feel so good. When the day came, I went to meet Alex at the restaurant that he had booked for us. I entered and waited for about 20 minutes for him to show. I began to get impatient and asked a waiter if he'd seen a boy with blonde hair and blue eyes come in at all. 
The waiter told me he had, but he'd left with a tall girl with long brown hair and brown eyes. What? Who was the girl he left with? And why? I thought of everyone I knew who fit that description. I couldn't think of anyone. Except for Rosie. But she lived in Pennsylvania. Why would she be here talking to my boyfriend? I decided to call Alex, but he sounded muffled and I heard a girl talking in the background. It sounded like they were arguing and then the call ended. This was so weird. What happened? I had no idea what was going on, so I headed home. On my way, I felt like someone was following me. And then I realized that there was one car driving very slowly after me. When I tried stopping, it also stopped. Oh my god. Was it having anything to do with me? I felt terrified and started to run as quick as I could until I reached my house. I turned back and saw that car parked outside my house. I was shaking as I tried to open the door. And as I did, Sally zoomed past me and ran toward the car. I had only seen her act that way whenever Alex came over. She really liked Alex. Wait, Alex? That was it. Alex was in that car. Was it a prank? I ran over to see what the heck was going on. There, sitting in the driver's seat, was Rosie. And to my complete shock, Alex was tied up in the back seat. Rosie! I screamed. What are you doing here in New York with my boyfriend? Alex screamed, help! She told me you were waiting for me in her car, then she kidnapped me. Rosie quickly turned around and looked me right in the face. Oh, um, hi, Ella. What are you doing with my boyfriend? He's not a good guy for you, Ella. I need you to break up with him now or else I will drive away so you can never find him ever. Are you crazy? We will not break up just because you demand me to do that. Now let him go. I walked around to the passenger door to get Alex, but then the car started moving fast. I ran after the car, but I was too slow. But Sally ran after it too. And she didn't stop. She almost got hit by cars as she ran through traffic until she was out of sight. I was so scared. I was about to call the cops when I saw a police car zoom past me. How did they know about this already? Who called 911? I looked back and saw my mom standing outside with the phone waving at me nervously. She had seen all the commotion and called the cops. Thanks, Mom. There was nothing I could do now except wait. It was awful. I was so anxious. About an hour later, a cop car pulled up to our house. The cop stepped out and opened the back door, and out came Sally. I ran up to the police car and hugged Sally. She was safe, but what about Alex? The officer told me that they'd chased the car for almost two miles until they cornered it on a dead-end street. He said that Rosie was very fierce and tried resisting arrest, but they'd taken her to the station. To my relief, Alex was fine, and they dropped him back home. Phew. I just didn't understand it. Rosie was my best friend. Why would she try to seriously harm my boyfriend? I later found out that Rosie was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. It's a disorder that causes people to go through extreme mood swings and do things that are out of character and crazy. Rosie had a lot going on. As well as me not being around anymore, her dad had moved out. I didn't know this as she hadn't told me. Back then, I wasn't talking all that much to her. But I'd never expected that the separation Rosie felt was too much for her and could lead her to bipolar disorder. I was her only one at that time, so she wanted her to be my only one too. But Alex appeared and made her feel insecure and seriously jealous. It is fortunate there are no serious consequences. I really hope Rosie gets the proper treatment for her disorder. We might not be as close anymore, but in my eyes, she'll always be the girl who was there for me when I was being teased and I will always regret that I wasn't there to listen to her more when she needed me. I still feel sad about it all, but I'm trying to see the positives. Things with Alex are going great, and I'm happy here. It turns out city life is for me after all. Whether it's in friendship or love, people still need their own space. And sometimes, as sad as it is, people do grow apart. This happens in life. Being overjealous doesn't help mend things. It just pushes the other person further away. Have you ever met someone and known instantly that they are the one for you? 
I wish I'd realized sooner so that my teenage years hadn't been so full of drama and heartbreak. But you live and learn, right? And better late than never. By the way, I'm Versalis, and I'm 24 years old. It all began 14 years ago when I moved to New York and started at a new school. At that time, I assumed that moving from my hometown in France to New York would be no big deal. My mom and I were super excited and truly believed it would change our lives. Indeed, it did, but not in the ways I ever expected. On my first day at my new school, my mother insisted on driving me to school. When we arrived, I gave my mom a kiss on both of her cheeks and waved goodbye. My mom joked that she'd sort out any of the kids who dared to mess with me. I did feel quite shy, but I thought she was just joking. Turns out she wasn't. At lunchtime, I sat down at a random table, and suddenly this girl appeared and said, What do you think you're playing at, sitting at our table? I didn't even have time to reply before she picked up my lunch tray and threw it off the table right into the trash can. I said, move, she said. Everyone was staring at us now. I was so upset, I just covered my face. I didn't want to be that crybaby in front of all these new people, but I couldn't help it. The tears started falling. Then something crazy happened. A voice boomed out through the cafeteria, saying, Get away from her! And then, the next moment, I felt a hand reach out for my hand, and when I looked up, this gorgeous tall boy was standing there looking at me when he picked me up on my feet. Excuse me, the girl started, but the boy continued, What is wrong with you? Do you have a screw loose or something? Your attitude is so gross. It'll make me puke. You disgust me, and I don't want to be friends with someone like you. She stood there with her mouth wide open as he grabbed my hand and walked away. I could hear her scoff from behind me, but her facial expression looked as if she'd lost. I took his hand and followed him out of the cafeteria, and that's when he introduced himself as Ryder. We sat down outside, and he asked me if I was new around here, and then he told me he loved my accent. And he even offered me half of his baguette and said, Hey. Come on, chin up. I'll be your friend, okay? The best part is that the girl who bullied me had a major crush on him, so she was probably even angrier at me now. But I didn't care one bit. After that, I can't remember a time when we were apart. We were glued at the hip and did everything together. He taught me how to skateboard, and I taught him how to bake my famous pastries. We were like the dream team. He made me laugh so much, and he helped me become more confident. Day by day, I could tell I wanted to be more than just his friend, but I didn't dare tell him that. Then my 12th birthday rolled around, and my mom gave me a diary. She told me to write down all of my thoughts, and even my crushes so that I could reflect back on it one day. Then she winked at me and walked away. Ew, what was she talking about? I didn't have a crush. Did I? Okay, who am I kidding? I had the biggest crush ever on Ryder. Every time I saw him, I felt like there were a million butterflies in my stomach, and I woke up excited every day because I knew I'd get to see him. And then the time came for our school dance, and my friends were teasing me that I should go with Ryder. I kept telling them he was just my friend, but I couldn't fool them. They saw right through me. Later that day, Ryder invited me over to play video games, and as we were playing, he said... Hey, um, want to go to the dance with me? I couldn't believe it. My heart was thumping in my chest, but I tried to play it cool and said, Uh, sure, I guess. And you know what? We had the best time ever at the dance. I was for sure on cloud nine, and afterwards I decided to journal about it in my diary. I never wanted to forget that night. So I wrote pages upon pages of how Ryder made me feel and how I loved him so much. Little did I know how everything was about to change. A few days later, Ryder came over to my house, and as soon as I saw him, I had the biggest grin on my face. But quickly that grin faded when Ryder said he had something to tell me. I have some bad news. My family and I are moving to London in a month. This is a joke, right? Come on, stop playing around, I said, trying to hide the worry in my voice. But he just stayed quiet, and by then I knew he wasn't joking. I couldn't hold back the tears, and Ryder just reached out and held me in his arms, comforting me. He told me it would be okay, and we'd still keep in touch, 
but I felt like my whole world was crumbling around me. This was the worst news of my life. We decided to make our last month together the most fun we'd ever had. We went surfing, skateboarding, stargazing, and even did karaoke. I never wanted that month to end, but of course it did. On our last night together, we had a slumber party and stayed up all night waiting for the sun to rise. When it came time to say goodbye, he gave me a framed photo of the two of us and said if I ever felt sad, I could just look at it and remember the happy times. I wanted to tell him how I felt, but I couldn't, and so he left. I was so down that I ran upstairs and covered myself under the blanket and cried. Later that night, as usual, I was about to write my day in my diary when it was nowhere to be seen. I shouted at my mom and blamed her, but she just said I must have misplaced it. Now I had no writer and no diary. My life sucked. Summer quickly ended and it was time for high school. Even though I had my friends, my life wasn't the same without Ryder. But life goes on, and so eventually I tried to move on from Ryder. My friends told me that this guy Lucas had always had a crush on me, and maybe I should give him a chance. Well, soon we started dating, and even though I didn't have the same special connection with him as I had with Ryder, it was still fun, and it took my mind off of things. Fast forward seven years, and Lucas and I were still together. The relationship wasn't great, but I had my dream job and was living in my dream loft apartment, so I couldn't complain too much. Plus, Ryder had drifted away from my mind. I decided it was time to really put some work into my relationship with Lucas. So one night, I told him I was working late and booked us a surprise trip to Paris. When I got home, I was so excited to tell Lucas, so I ran up to our bedroom, and to my complete horror, I found him lying in our bed kissing another girl. They didn't even notice me at first. So I screamed, what are you doing? Well, that got their attention, and the girl ran off. I thought Lucas would apologize, but he just said, what do you expect? You won't give me what I want, and you make me wait for marriage. Then he stomped out of the room and said, I can have any girl I want. I was so shocked. I just dropped to the floor and burst into tears. Finally, he shown me his true colors, and so I kicked him out. The next few weeks were some of the worst of my life, even worse than when Ryder moved to London. I felt so stupid for wasting so much time with Lucas. One night, I was particularly sad, and I suddenly remembered the framed photo Ryder had given me. I dug it out of the back of my wardrobe and held it close to my heart. My friends called me, tried to get me to go out with them. They did everything to help lift my mood up, but I wasn't interested. I just needed time alone to process everything. I thought to myself about how the only person I wanted to see now was Ryder. But where was he? How was he doing? I had no idea at all. Another depressing week went by. I was lounging on my couch, soullessly staring at the TV in boredom. Then suddenly there was a knock at the door. I went to open it, and oh my god, Ryder was standing there. Was this real or was I hallucinating? I was so surprised I just jumped into his arms and didn't want to let go. We must have stood there hugging for ages. And then suddenly Ryder said, I have something of yours. When I let go of him, he was holding my diary. Turns out Ryder had been in touch with my mom, and when she told him about my cheating boyfriend, he decided to come to New York and cheer me up. And then reality hit. He'd taken my diary? What if he'd read it? Well, he had... And he said that's why he'd come to see me, because he wanted to talk to me about it all. I was blushing like crazy. And then he said, I've always loved you, V. Even when we were kids, I've never stopped thinking about you, and I want to be with you. Then he reached over and kissed me, and I swear time just stopped. I'd been waiting for this moment my whole life. That week was like a haze of kissing and chatting and catching up on lost time. He told me about his ex-girlfriends, and I told him about Lucas and the cheating. Then I plucked up the courage and asked him if he'd like to go to Paris with me, seeing as the trip was already booked. Of course he said yes, and the next week we flew there and had the best week of our entire lives. We went to the Eiffel Tower and even visited my old neighborhood where I'd grown up. It was magical. And then one day Ryder said he had to do a bit of work and told me to go pamper myself at a local spa. When I was done, I had a text from him asking to meet him on the roof of our hotel. He was so romantic like that. I first went back to the hotel room where he'd laid out a black sparkly dress for me to wear, and then I headed up to the roof. 
I couldn't believe it. There were almost 1,000 roses laid out to form a path. And at the end of the path was Ryder wearing a suit. I love you, V, he began to say. I always have. And I can't imagine a life without you. Will you marry me? I gasped in shock and screamed, yes, at the top of my voice. I'd loved him ever since I was a kid, and now my dream of being together forever had finally come true. I guess it took us some time to reach this point, but the best things in life are worth waiting for, right?